The next section is going to be a panel discussion. And we're going to go global. We're going to have a discussion that will help us connect East African business leaders with investors for collaboration, market entry, and global expansion in international trade. This uh, panel is going to be moderated by a British Ghanaian journalist and broadcaster who has been in the industry for a very long time. As I mentioned, we're going to explore strategies for strengthening partnership between East African business leaders and UK investors. Panelists will also address critical issues such as maximizing benefits from free trade agreements, identify investment gaps in infrastructure, and ensure investor confidence through robust legal frameworks and security measures. We'll highlight the importance of SMEs, startups, and African diaspora in driving innovation and fostering sustainable economic growth between East Africa and the UK. So let me first introduce my moderator, my brother, Henry Bozu. Please, a round of applause for him as he comes in. Tenza, who's put this event together. Uh, he and I go back a long way. In fact, I remember him organizing such an event, a smaller one, many years ago when President Museveni came here, I think to launch the Pearl of Africa campaign. And uh, I remember being a young journalist at the time asking a question because the president seemed to be asking people from the UK and Europe to come to visit Uganda. And uh, I said, well, what about the African diaspora? Include, he said, uh, small boy, where are you from? <laughs> I said, well, oh, Ghana. And he said, no, but where are you? I said, well, born in Manchester. Yes, OK. But, uh, and he says, you are welcome to. You are most welcome. And, and, and I have only touched down in Uganda while we're feeling on the way to Rwanda. But I'm going to correct that mistake. Very, no, no, one or two Ugandans are waving their fingers at me. Now, now, usually at events like this, and I do a number of them, both here and in various parts of Africa, the protocol is for um, a senior minister to speak first of all, then somebody from a multilateral organization, a, um, a, a diplomat, and then you finally you get down to the business community, and then some angry, disenchanted activist is invited to speak as a, member, as a member of the youth, that's not going to happen today. I think we're going to do things in reverse. Because let's remember what the focus is, if I could have your attention. So we're going to explore strategies in this session for strengthening partnerships between East African business leaders and UK investors. And the focus is on market entry, global expansion, and enhancing trade efficiency. So we have academics here. We have country advisors from the IFC, we have members of ministries here, we have trade envoys, uh, experts in trade disputes, a full range of, of expertise. But I thought we should go from the particular to the general. I'm going to start off with Ross McNally, Chief Executive and Executive Chair of the Hampshire Chamber of Commerce. Because when I was looking through the, 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 the range, the list, of speakers on this panel, I thought, what is, the, what is the, the executive chair, the chief exec of Hampshire Chamber of Commerce doing at a Uganda and East Africa um, business and trade event? And I thought, this is intriguing. We must explore this first of all. So let me ask uh, Ross McDally, uh, why are you here today? Why Uganda? Why East Africa? That's a very good question. Yes. Um, Hampshire Chamber of Commerce um, is part of the ecosystem of um, international trade. I mean, we work with London Chamber of Commerce, we work with the other Chambers of Commerce around the country, 55 of them, to ensure that, you know, trade moves. We have some 800 members uh, in, our, in our network, uh, businesses, many of whom trade internationally. And we're at the heart of the economy of Hampshire, which uh, boasts four world-class universities, two ports, Farnborough and Farnborough Aerospace, and a whole technology 
what we call a technology triangle, a, a, an area of businesses across the whole of the Central South, which is involved in everything from life sciences to uh, aerospace to maritime and marine engineering. And because of that, and because of their potential in terms of global reach, the Chamber has a new strategy, which is to go beyond just enabling trade, but to actually driving it. Yep. And so we have, a, we have a strategy that is l literally we're in the foothills of that. We are just starting. And my role as the executive chair is to explore where these opportunities are. And uh, I place East Africa at, really at the top of that because... Why, why East Africa at the top? Uh, as, a, uh, as a descendant of uh, West African excellence, I hope, and, uh, and heritage, and the, the West Africans will be saying, what about us? But you're saying East, why? Well, because of the, um, I suppose, the burgeoning and the growing and developing middle classes, because of the education, because of the language, because of the cultural connections, because of the diaspora, because of all of these reasons, there is a very good way in which trade with British businesses can be engendered. And we've got to, we've got to really encourage businesses to go beyond uh, purely FDI or, or, or purely buying sort of resource-based but actually adding value, really value-added uh, 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 industry within East Africa so that the, the international relationships develop to the benefit of both. You can't, you can't just have it as a one-way traffic. And looking at the statistics that we saw in some of the earlier presentations, Hampshire, as, as a very strong international trade uh, and, and part, of, part of global Britain, particularly because of Southampton Port and other reasons, we, we, we have a responsibility to say, where are these emerging markets? It's not, it's not my issue to look at where we can trade success, successfully now. To be perfectly frank, that's happening. Mm -hmm. What we've got to do is see where, where can we develop that is going to be changing our prospects and actually the prospects of the markets in which we're operating with over the next 25 years. And if you're not looking at East Africa, you're actually missing the point, I would say. Okay, Ross, thank you very much. I should uh, say to our audience that once I've heard from our uh, speakers up here on the panel, then um, might ask one or two supplementaries and then invite you to ask a question, um, give a supplementary of your own, make a comment, a, a brief one. We want them to be timely and relevant. We've got about an hour, so let's do what we can. So uh, thank you very much for that opening salvo, Ross. And I'm going to go to, and I'm instead of going to go from the particular to the general, so let's build from, from Hampshire and let, let's move across to, to uh, London. We've got Richard Moyer here, um, the Vice President of the London Chamber of Commerce. Um, I'm just wondering about uh, what, um, what, what you say, or, well, I suppose what Ross said a moment or two ago, and how uh, the London Chamber of Commerce um, builds on that. Uh, what role is London playing to foster economic growth and technological advancement in East Africa, and if you want, you can also build into that answer um, the importance of the Commonwealth in helping to ensure strengthen economic ties in sectors like finance and insurance. I need a yep. Thank you. Well, uh, I appreciate the question, but I'm going to widen it even more, because I was told by the organizers we can speak from the heart. Uh, London doesn't know it all. London has to learn too, so I see all this is a two-way street. Uh, we've had a history in Africa, it's not always been good. Uh, Brexit hasn't helped. Uh, Commonwealth, well, that could be UK's salvation, but it might also be too late because there's more and more Commonwealth countries looking to become republics. But leaving that message aside, I'd like us to think about education. Because just imagine business schools in Africa. There aren't enough of them. Uh, any research that's done on behalf of international business is usually done on a top-down basis from America, from Canada, from the UK. And so the, the perception we tend to have of business and trade with Africa is written from a, the wrong point of view, if you ask me. And what I make a plea for today is that we encourage greater research that actually emanates from Africa and gives a completely, well I would argue, will give a completely different perspective on how trade should be conducted. Uh, that's the first point. Then secondly, if we look ahead, remember, well you probably don't, but The Economist wrote an article in 2000. I remember. 
described, described, uh, am I talking or are you? Right, so, so okay. <laughs> so it went, from, it went from the hopeless continent to now the hopeful continent. And actually I'd argue there's, it's gone beyond hope now to something far more realistic and positive. And that's really why we're here today. And I think today is a good example of that. Now to come back to the point about London. If we look at, uh, for example, the role of insurance, Insurance, as you would all know, I presume, is a risk transfer mechanism. Uh, without insurance, you can't trade. And if you look at the history of trade in Africa, most of that was backed by Lloyds of London underwriters, and they put certain countries and certain sectors of business on the map because they were insurable. And therefore, insurance is a trade facilitator, and London clearly leads in various classes and also new classes of risk, particularly if we're talking about electronic transfer of funds and digitization in general. And I would encourage countries represented here to increasingly develop their own indigenous insurance capability, particularly with the use of captive insurance. And most people don't really know about captors, but I do know a little bit. And I would actively encourage you to consider self-insurance as a way of facilitating business. And if we go into um, banking now, well, bankers are a bit like Marmite. Uh, sometimes you like it, sometimes you don't, or you don't like them at all, but we all need them because money does make the world go around for better or for worse. And we have um, a trade facilitating bank here today who are active sponsors, and I can vouch for them uh, because without those that documents that they offer, trade doesn't happen either, but it has to go hand in hand with insurance. So I think I've said enough for the minute. Thank you. Now, do we have Lars Jensen here from Colas Limited? Is Lars here at all? Because I wanted to hear from a, uh, a UK-based organization that is involved in a transformative infrastructure project in uh, Uganda, that's the Kabala International Airport, if he comes in at some point. Ah, oh yes. Um, would you mind coming? Let me pass a microphone to you. If you. Maybe if you put yourself up there somewhere. No, keep that one. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So thank you very much, Lars. So you're with Colas Limited. I want uh, to hear about your experience of working in uh, U Uganda, um, being involved in a major infrastructure project, the International Airport Kabale, um, and um, what it's been like partnering with businesses on the ground and with the government. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, thanks a lot for that question. I've been in Uganda for eight years now. Uh, we came in uh, in 2016 and 2017 to start the construction of the, of the new Kabalega International Airport, a uh, project funded from the UK Export Finance. And um, I love Uganda. Um, when you uh, arrive at the, uh, at the uh, airport, uh, you are met by a, a, a smiling lady at the immigration. Uh, and uh, you feel welcome immediately. You, you drive on the beautiful road into Kampala, um, all smiles, and then uh, you hit the potholes in Kampala. And um, then uh, you, start, uh, uh, you start asking yourself, what, what can we do to, uh, to help the situation? So for the past several years, uh, we in Colas, we've been uh, developing a project with Kampala Capital City to, uh, with UK Export Finance to uh, rehabilitate roads in Kampala. Um, so that's, that's our aim uh, since uh, 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 about 65% of the GDP of uh, Uganda is actually generated in Kampala. Uh, Kampala has for many years been uh, uh, been suffering from, uh, I think we've got uh, uh, the PSST here, he can uh, confirm that uh, funding for Kampala city roads probably not been keeping up with demand. Um, so we, we are trying to, uh, to uh, implement this transformative project in Kampala. Uh, it's going well and uh, we expect to, to hopefully secure a contract uh, in, the, in the nearer future. 
Um, so the way you take us, Lars, through Sorry? a couple of the stages you had to go through. Oh, my in terms goodness. Of securing yeah. the finance, yeah. guarantees, and then working with the government to get to where you are now. Yes, uh, it's, it's a long process. Uh, we started the engagement with Kampala City in 2017. Um, we are now in 2024. Um, we, uh, we are getting very close, but we are not there yet. We have the finance. Uh, we are uh, at the moment uh, negotiating the contract with Kampala City. Uh, we've got uh, my good friend uh, David Luimbaje here from KCCA. Uh, we are moving closer. But it is a long process, and uh, you as an investor in Uganda, uh, you have to be prepared for the long haul. Uh, no quick fixes. Uh, it is a, a lengthy process. But it can be done, uh, and um, uh, the best way forward is to, uh, to partner with local um, partners who understand the market, who understand the processes. Um, that's, that's really the best way f uh, forward. And, and that's, been our, that's been our strategy from day one, to really uh, become a local company. <laughs> and final thought at this point, what change Oh, let's be delicate here. What could have helped accelerate the process? Because um, you've been doing this since 2017. Yes, yes. Uh, accelerate the process. Um, well, um, you have to really understand the process. Uh, and in the beginning, perhaps, uh, we didn't fully understand the process. I think we could have cut off uh, two or three years uh, at the start if we had understood the process. But uh, you, you, uh, you have to um, map out the way forward. You have to know the stakeholders, uh, and, uh, and you have to be prepared to, uh, to invest in the process. And uh, so it is a process, but it can be done. And I, I would also like to just uh, raise the flag for the British Chamber of Commerce in Uganda. I'm one of the founding board members of the uh, newly established British Chamber of Commerce in Uganda, and we are ready to support anybody with an interest in, in, uh, in uh, trading and investing uh, yeah. in Uganda. Okay, Lars, for now, thank you very much. I suspect you may have a follow-up or two when we go to our colleagues in the room. Um, now, logically, I should go to François Panettier, the Africa regional head of the UK Export Finance's global business or origination function, but um, I don't think he's here. But also logically, I should next go to Mr. Skupta, the country advisor and economics um, manager, the Paramita, Mr. Skupta, at the International Finance Corporation, are playing a, a crucial role in shaping economic strategies that foster private sector growth. First of all, your reaction to the example you've just heard of a business working with a government here and then working with a government on a major infrastructure project in Uganda. Thank you for the question, which is off script, but it's welcome. No, 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 it's always <laughs> off script. I do live radio and TV. This is how it has to be. <laughs> Absolutely. I have to listen and then respond. First, it's a pleasure being here and thank you for inviting IFC, which is the private sector arm of the World Bank Group to be here. Just responding to what we heard from Lars, and I think it builds on our experience uh, as a private sector partner, both advising and financing uh, businesses in emerging markets, uh, what we've heard frequently from businesses around the world interested in emerging markets is they can often deal with the delays, they just need more certainty. Right? There's a lot of need for transparency and certainty. If they know it's going to take five years and that's how it's laid out, they can plan for it. It's the lack of certainty and lack of transparency that often bothers them. Uh, because when you think that there are 18 processes and a 19th one shows up, uh, you know, at the end of the fourth year, that's the surprise that they uh, don't, can't factor in in their business plans. And so I think at, at, the, at the heart of whether it's private investments or PPPs, uh, governments are also working very hard across not only Africa, East Africa, but around all emerging markets to bring in that certainty and predictability and transparency. Some things cannot be always cut short in time. There are some processes and due diligence that will require a little bit of time, given the world that we live in, especially around you know, environmental clearances and some other due diligence. But uh, what investors are seeking uh, across sectors is predictability and certainty. And I think uh, bringing in e-governance, bringing in some of these digital tools to improve the quality of information available and making things not only informationally on the portal, but also transactionally on the portal uh, is certainly going to make the lives of investors and developers like Lars a little easier. And when it comes to that 
greater certainty, that ability to know what you're planning for, where should that greater certainty come from? Which government departments, which entities would, uh, should be providing that certainty? Because people here are keen, they're interested, but they also want to be certain. Yeah. So, um, and I think, you know, uh, PS is here on the panel, and so, you know, he would... He, he can vouch for this, but when it comes to investments in the real sector or the financial sector in any emerging market, the certainty predictability is cuts across various government ministries. So it's not only the responsibility of the Ministry of Trade and Industry or the Ministry of Finance, but it, there has to be a, a, a common sense of commitment um, and, and, and zest for making the enabling environment conducive for the private sector to truly genuinely want participation of both domestic and foreign, small, medium, and large, uh, to truly participate in those growth processes. Uh, so a lot of this is often centralized. You know, It's driven by an anchor in the Ministry of Trade and Industry. Uh, it's, it's supported by the Ministry of Finance, and there is often an investment promotion agency uh, in most of the countries that we work in, which holds this centralized portal or a kind of trying to be the one-stop shop interface for investors. Uh, but it varies across jurisdictions. In some places, it sits in a, in a dedicated unit. In some other cases, it sits in the ministries. But it is a whole of government effort. It cannot be that there's one ministry that is transparent and predictable and the other one remains opaque and it, that doesn't function because it will require clearances from cross-cutting ministries in government to, to make some of these uh, projects happen. Mm -hmm. And as the country advisor and the economics manager at the, the, the IFC, you're in a good position to answer this. I mean, what are the sectors that you, if approached by a business or an organization, an entity, uh, with a view to investing, but wanting to partner with you, what, what are the areas, the sectors that you're minded to green light? You think, yes, this works in Uganda, this works in the region, this not so much. Well, that's, that's a tricky one. But yes, I think it I'll, has to be tricky. I'll build on the ATM's uh, acronym that PS referred to. And, you know, we are seeing that become a very popular acronym across East Africa and other parts of Africa, where there's agribusiness, uh, tourism, mineral related, and uh, in this case, it was science technology, but services, and the whole range of healthcare and education services. But I think cutting across all of these is uh, basically the bedrock of robust infrastructure, right? So energy, I think what you have, the sectors put up on the, on, on, on the backdrop here, um, energy, uh, telecom, uh, core infrastructure uh, is really at the heart because it's really about availability of good quality, reliable, well-priced, competitive energy, which, uh, and which now needs to be clean, renewable energy, which will drive a lot of the basic competitiveness. Other than that, there are revealed comparative advantages of different countries, and you know, it all depends on whether it's uh, Uganda, or Tanzania, or, or Kenya, or any of the other East African countries that we work in, we do have certain sectors of, uh, of promise or potential based on the analytics that we do at the World Bank Group uh, on where we see the inherent comparative advantage and where we see you can build off a, off, off a basic level of investment and then add to it new technologies and new enterprises coming in. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, Paramita Das Gupta. Um, Let's uh, move over to Professor Sangeeta Korana um, from Assam Business School, a professor of international trade policy. I remember not so long ago, um, a former prime minister launching Global Britain. That was Britain's post. Bri you, you, oh, why, why, are you, why are you laughing, Richard? Um, a former prime minister saying, well, you know, this is a new Britain. This is um, global Britain. No longer are we shackled to the EU. This is post-Brexit and the sunlit uplands. And there's an assumption that the trade policies of other countries and other regions would match the new policy as stated by, stated by the British government. And I'm just wondering how much of a match there is between the stated trade policy of our government entity here with those in the places where we want to do far more business. Um, such as Uganda and East Africa, where there is a Commonwealth link with many countries. Thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, esteemed forum. Uh, I'll just talk a little bit about myself a second, so I'll set the context. Yes. So 
I essentially work on trade agreements. I work closely with governments. I advise them. I support them in designing uh, free trade agreements, and that's my expertise. And I was also involved in the um, in an advisory capacity for the TLIP project. I'll talk about that in a minute and how that is really sensational, and it has the potential to transform the face of trade. With regards to your question about global Britain and trade policy, well, it all st it has start it did start off very well in the first place, where there was this declaration about doing trade agreements with countries around the world, and an example of that, which I will say in some form, is the recent EPA, the Economic Partnership with Kenya. Right, And as I understand now, there are other ESC members that would also like that have expressed an interest to join the economic partnership agreement. Now, it's very good, you know, on paper it all looks very good. But when you start looking into the operationalizing of a trade agreement, that is what actually matters for businesses and for consumers as well, because it's the consumers who benefit from lower prices. And this would happen only essentially when trade is frictionless. And we've been talking about the importance of reducing barriers to trade over the past one hour or so. So, an ex so what happened uh, over the last few years, since um, the last five years, uh, the FCTO has come up with this major initiative. And one example that I would like to highlight as to how trade between Africa and the UK can be increased is the Trademark Africa Initiative. And this is currently in, this, in the second strategy round, which finishes in 2025. It should have finished in 23, but because of COVID, got an extension. And I have been fortunate enough, actually, to be ad associated in an advisory capacity on the um, UK-Kenya trade logistics information pipeline. Let me talk a little bit about this as, and what it does. So the, it is actually a brilliant initiative that the government has launched, uh, and it's a pilot project. And the aim is, it basically what it does is, it uses blockchain technology. And what it does is, it links all actors in the supply chain. So the objective of this initiative was to actually reduce administrative burden and administrative costs, cut down um, log you know, logistic um, barriers that exist, and also reduce duplication of documents that has been a problem in Africa. As far as we understand, the objective of TLIP and in very many ways what, ha what it has achieved is that administrative admin, uh, procedures and time to import and export are expected to go down by 30% between Kenya and the UK. The compliance cost is going to go down by as much as 20%, and the duplication of steps in the trading processes are, is expected to go down by 50%. Now, how is it that this, these numbers which I have just thrown out at you, will, can these be achieved? Basically, this can be achieved only when governments work, but also when the private sector works, because we know the issues that the app that African exporters face are essentially that of uh, problems with certification, um, logistics issues, custom formalities. So I think what's really very important here is to um, promote a public-private partnership in a manner that the private sector supports the government initiatives that have been launched, especially the one uh, which I alluded to, TLIP. I'll just finish here by saying that the pilot project has been successful, and uh, we test, so it applies to tea and coffee and flowers from Kenya, and Kenya is a major exporter of these three. There are also plans to expand it to um, other agricultural goods and um, to animal product produce as well. So far, tea and coffee has been successful. So I think I'll stop here and I'll pass yeah, it Yeah, I, I do have a, a, a brief follow-up. I mean, I talked about the UK trade policy, and I described it, um, uh, Sangeeta, as, as global Britain, for want of a better word. But what about the trade policies of the partner countries, like Uganda? <laughs> Richard, you chuckled. Um, I'll let you explain that chuckle from a sedentary position in just a moment or two. But, but um, uh, Sangeeta, what about the trade policies of, for example, Uganda or, or Kenya or some of the other countries in the region? How would you characterize them? And are they, quotes 
open enough because there are some countries which have been minded to become more restrictive to protect their domestic trade. Thank you. Very interesting question. Yes, protectionism is on the rise wherever we see all over the world. Uh, Africa is no exception. The, well, the creation of the African Free Trade Agreement was supposed to have energized trade within Africa. But the problem still persists that all countries have their own sets of legislation. They are trying to come up, but it still is. Earlier it was a patchwork which was very heavy. That patchwork is getting diluted. There is more connection happening. But then let's also remember that Africa needs to catch up because the shape of trade is changing essentially. And what I mean by saying the shape of the shape and the contours of trade are changing is that we are moving away from paper-based trade more towards a digital, more towards digital trade. So we have to focus more on the digital economy. And for Africa to actually benefit from uh, the free trade agreements and the market access enhancement that it brings, it's important that Africa stays ahead of the curve and goes down the digital economy route. Because that is the way to go for not only Africa, but for all countries in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that, Sangeeta. Um, let's go, uh, well, last but not least, uh, for now, to Baju Vasani, um, barrister and arbitrator at 20 Essex and senior fellow in international law. Uh, oh, no. oh. Hang on a minute. Yes, I'm getting confused now because there are some people who are meant to be here who are not here. Um, um. P.S. Ram. Ah, you're not on my list. Please introduce yourself. <laughs> I, I already spoke, That's so right. I, I'm sure they know me. Unless you have a question. Aha! Okay, I didn't hear my colleague announce you. Ramathan Gubi, yes? Ah, sorry. Well, it's perfect. We come to you at exactly an opportune moment um, because I want to know what you make of what you've heard, what we've said about Uganda and the region, and whether you are in the kind of shape that Sangeeta says, you need to be in order to benefit from the kind of bilateral and multilateral uh, trade agreements and um, hopefully a more enabling environment. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I, I appreciate the feedback I'm, I'm, I'm listening to. Um, Uganda is one of those small economies that are fully liberalized, as I said and almost overly deregulated to ensure that we can uh, be able to facilitate business and investment. And um, we are now on track in terms of digitization. We have set up a one-stop shop for investment where we process all the required licensing, registration, um, tax identification, and so on for newly uh, set up businesses. We've also been able to put in place electronic procurement system so that we can deal with the bureaucracy and uh, all the processes that uh, used to impede quick uh, procurement decisions and processes. We have now one of the, uh, it is still uh, quite new, but the World Bank has rated it uh, one of the most promising electronic procurement systems in the region. We are working on it so that we can uh, uh, deal with some of the issues, the private uh, farms have raised to us so many uh, processes and um, and the procedures and, and some of them are quite slow. Yeah, well, what are you going to do, Permanent Secretary, to accelerate the process to get these blockages out of the way? Because it's not just Uganda. In um, trying to do business in many countries in, in what people call the sub-region, the same things crop up again and again and again. Mm. Of course, of course, it re blockages. It requires two <laughs> two things, because uh, both sides have to uh, to address 
the issues on the side of government, as I, I'm telling you, uh, we are addressing some issues, but also the private farms, we are encouraging them uh, to pass through the, the, the right channels um, uh, to get helped. Um, sometimes you find that uh, they have wasted a lot of time with the middlemen instead of approaching government through the right channels and they, and they get uh, things done. And uh, usually uh, those that pass through the right channels, <laughs> they find it much easier. Yeah. But when you try to, to avoid the channels, mm -hmm. then you land into uh, other layers <laughs> of, uh, of... I love euphemisms, other layers. Uh, okay. I have here the colonel, they told you, in Uganda we have put in place a unit yeah. headed by a colonel in the military mm -hmm. to ensure that we can be able to um, help the investors get rid of the African disease of finding, you know, processes into intermediaries and, uh, and those middlemen of, of processes. I, for me, I think that's where uh, so often uh, when some of the business people from this world come, they think in Africa it's not easy uh, to get things done, so you have to get through someone. Yeah. But that someone is actually adding layers and layers sure, of sure. difficulty because that's what makes them relevant. It's a good way. I like the fact that you've put a colonel mm -hmm. in place <laughs> in that particular department. I've been given the 10 minute sign, as in, and then we have to close. Sadly, I hope we have a bit more time. But let's get a couple of um, brief questions or very brief comments from um, the room. And if we have time, we'll get a couple of responses from our colleagues here. And if you have a question, for a member of the panel, please identify them and tell me to whom. Yes, can we get a microphone to the gentleman at the front? Thank you, Wilson. Yes, take my. Oh, yes, yeah. Please make the question brief because we don't have much time. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, moderator. I have just two brief questions. One to the madam about to the funding. In the case of Uganda, we have uh, the best meat of Ankole cow. We have very good milk, which can easily be exported. But we have a challenge of what we call FMD, foot mouth disease, that comes from the neighboring countries. We, how I wish your intervention can be specifically to that. Algeria has given us a market, but as long as you have FMD a year before, they, you cannot be allowed. The second question, of course, goes back to my own home which I wouldn't want to open up here. There's no way you can do businesses unless you have a strong chamber. And the colleagues, senior colleagues who are here, what we are talking about in New Hampshire here, chamber, go back home. We don't have strong chambers. I have been a member of the International Chamber of Commerce, sitting in Paris for like two years. The language that is talked about there is far different from the language we talk about in our countries uh, because of the differences of our, of our uh, economy. I'm going to have to ask you to land because we don't have much time. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Sangeeta first. Um, he was talking about meat and, and, and milk and export and what you said, foot and mouth. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, this is an issue that has been ongoing for quite some time and we know that the requirements to export to export to the UK and to the EU market are very stringent. Until the necessary certificates are not issued, it's not going to be possible. I appreciate that, you know, when exporters export to another country, it builds in an element of cost. But remember, um, at the moment, as far as my understanding goes, it's more open towards cut flowers, fruits, vegetables. Meat would obviously, I, as I would assume, would come in the next tranche when uh, the self-certification requirements have been met. And you know what? As a result of blockchain, it will really, once you know, the expertise has been built up, uh, it would be very easy to export goods across through those corridors. I hope that answers, probably yeah. not. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Richard, you wanted to respond? Yeah, quick one. Thank you, I agree with your question. If you were in Germany and you had a company as a business, it'd be obligatory to join the Chamber of Commerce. Unfortunately, that's not like here. I wish it was because 
it would help solve the problem that you're talking about. So why doesn't your government make it obligatory? If you have a company domiciled in your country, you must be a member of the chamber. And that way it's a conveyor belt, both up and down, relaying businesses' needs to government and vice versa. And it clearly works. Sadly, it's not the case in the UK. I wish it were. Thank you for that. We have a question from the left, I think. Yep, far left. Good morning. Good morning. My name is uh, Engineer Elias Mugisha. I had a small suggestion to our PSST, and I want to thank him for um, elaborating on the issue of having middlemen creating layers. Whenever we, um, we have investors, they have to go through the public investment management system. This was disseminated in 2016. We've looked at a number of projects under UKF, and I think Lars can pick up this under Afande Nakalema. It takes a minimum of two years to go through all the gates. If you have to go through the development committee, it takes not less than 700 days for you, for a loan to be approved. So we are requesting that if there is a way we can reduce on the timelines, because if it takes two years to go through those gates, then we are looking at three years. Some of these uh, banks or ECAs have a, a portfolio uh, turnaround time of three years. So if it takes you two years to go through the PIMS, then you're left with one year to actually mobilize. So by the time you mobilize, actually the portfolio has, if you look at all the other ECAs, it takes majority of them, or development, uh, development partners, it takes three years their portfolio to revolve. All right, I'm going to have to so ask you to land because we are out of time. Yes. Uh, perhaps the permanent secretary could respond briefly Thank to you. that. Yes. I've got it, actually, what he's trying to say. The problem in the past, and again, it links with what I've, I've said, we've had people coming to do business with the government, like projects, and you want to first get the project approved before it is appraised. And then after it has been approved, then you, I remember you have already signed an agreement with the, the AC, then you go into appraisal. Now we have stopped that. For you to get a budget code so that you can enter into our system, you have to first undergo the appraisal system and then the other way round works. So th this is likely to reduce the headache because most of the, uh, like my friend who was talking about uh, his projects in Kampala City Council, um, uh, similarly uh, to, to, to the airport and so on of Kavale, the challenge was getting projects into the system when they have not been praised. Then when you start implementation, that's when you move backwards to study them. We have stopped that and we are hopeful that this is going to, to help. It wasn't having anything to do with the law. The law is okay, the processes are okay, but it was just trying to actually circumvent the process and you end up uh, causing yourself a lot of headache. Mm. We have resolved that now. Thank you very much for that answer and I'm sorry but we're out of time. That was uh, energetic. I hope you found it useful. And of course, our speakers are around uh, during the day for you to ask them directly any question that you um, come up with and you think hasn't quite been answered yet. But also, over to you. Put your hands together for the panel. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.